This is She Creates Business, a podcast for wedding pros. Your host, Kinsey Roberts, interviews incredible women in the wedding industry who are making their mark and creating success on their terms. Join the conversation. Well, hey there and happy Tuesday. Welcome to She Creates Business, a podcast for wedding pros. This is your host, Kinsey Roberts. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, Today, we have an awesome guest on the show. She is a fellow ambassador in the Wedding Business Bosses Facebook group. If you're not part of that group, come on over and join us. It's uh, hosted by Ginny uh, Ginny Krause and Kristen Kaplan, and Becky and I are both ambassadors in there. Becky is just a complete boss. You know, speaking of wedding business bosses, I don't know of many people who embody that term more than Becky does. And today she is bringing her expertise on pricing our wedding businesses over to the podcast. And I'm really looking forward to you hearing this interview. Before we get there, let me read you a little bit about Becky so that you can kind of get to know where she's coming from and a little bit about her business, Becky's Bride. So she was born and raised in Birmingham, Alabama, and she is a true Southerner at heart. Becky graduated from the University of Alabama at Birmingham with a degree in accounting. And while accounting wasn't the right career choice for her, it sure does help in running her own business. She is the current owner of Becky's Brides, a wedding planning firm in Birmingham, Alabama, where she plans flawless Southern weddings. Becky's Brides was born six years ago as a side hustle while Becky continued to work in corporate America. And three years in, she quit her full-time job to pursue wedding planning full-time and has never looked back. In her first year of running Becky's Brides full-time, she grew her company to a six-figure wedding planning business, and it has continued to grow each year. In her spare time, she loves traveling, reading, and HGTV. Those are some hobbies that I could absolutely get behind, and I know you are going to love this conversation and learn a ton about pricing and answering those hard pricing questions that we get in our businesses. So without further ado, let's go to the show. Becky Baker, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for being here. If you guys don't know, so I, of course, gave you Becky's professional bio. She has so much experience. I'm so excited to talk to her today. We are both ambassadors in the Wedding Business Bosses Facebook groups. If you're not in that Facebook group, I would love for you to come and join us. It's so much fun. And there are just amazing pros like Becky who are in there helping us all every day. And it's just absolutely wonderful. So Becky, I'm so excited to have you on the show today to talk about all things pricing and money which is a weird topic sometimes. <laughs> it is, but I'm excited to be here and talking about it. Me too. Okay, so I was just telling, uh, we were just chatting about this offline, you guys. I have compiled some questions that I have seen like in the Facebook group and I have gotten from listeners via email and Instagram DM and just kind of everywhere where wedding pros are hanging out. I see these questions come up over and over again. I would say that I mostly see them for people who are newer in the industry or if they're making a pivot in their business or even if they've been in the industry for a while and they're like ready to raise their prices or something like that, or maybe they've never raised their prices. All of these questions always come up. So we, Becky and I are really just going to kind of like jam back and forth about these questions um, and we're going to get her opinion and her answers on these. And uh, I was telling Becky, some of these are, they could be their own podcast episode. So we're not going to, we have 30 minutes today, which is great. But uh, so if we don't go deep enough into a question for you, shoot me an email and, you know, maybe we will pull it out and make it a podcast episode down the road. But um, I am ready, Becky, to get started if you are ready. I'm ready. Cool. Let's do this. Okay, let's do it. So the first question that I always see, and this is, again, this is like very broad, but I always see how do I price my services? How do I choose what to price my services at? That is such a broad question. Yes. And I think it's something that um, a lot of um, creative business owners really struggle with. I think that we all struggle with that to start with. And sometimes we struggle with it forever, I feel like. Um, but I think the most important thing is that you have to do your research for your own business and determine how you're going to price yourself based on that. Um Kristen Kaplan's workbook is a great place to get started to understanding your expenses and how much business you actually want to take ideally um, and how much money you make or you want to make and of course taxes and helping you calculate exactly what you need to charge for your products or services. And so I think that that is the best way to do it is just really understanding your expenses, what you really want to make and how much you can physically take as far as 
you know, your, your products or services and then go from there. Mm, I love that. And you guys, you know that we just had Kristen Kaplan on the uh, podcast a couple episodes ago. Um, well, at the time of this recording, it was a couple episodes ago. We're recording on June 28th. But uh, so by the time you hear this, that will be like July or August. So um, let just take a peek back there. And we did talk a lot about the pricing workbook and it really is phenomenal. And what I like about it, it's not fluffy like, oh, wouldn't it be nice if you made this? It's like spreadsheets and stuff. So you can actually <laughs> track your taxes and your expenses, your hard costs, your um, you know, your um, costs that are always going to happen, you know, per wedding, things of that nature. So yeah, totally, Becky. What would you say? What do you say? Like when, um, how much does like our local market factor into pricing our services? Or does it? Personally, I don't think it does at all. Ooh, um, because <laughs> you don't really know if your competitors are prof- profitable. You mm-hmm. don't know about their business expenses. You don't know how many weddings they're taking. Um, so I really think that comparing yourself to your local market is a mistake and that you should really focus on what you are um offering and your expenses and what you need to make in order to price appropriately. I see that in the Facebook groups a lot. You know, people are looking at what others are charging, but you just don't know all the ins and outs of someone else's businesses. So I just don't think that that is necessarily the best way and the most profitable way to start out pricing yourself. And if we do, okay, let's say we do our research, we figure out our taxes, our expenses, what we want to bring home to our families, and we kind of, you know, put the blinders on a little bit. Of course, we do need to be aware of what's going on in our local market. I think that's just good business and like have your feelers out there, but, you know, not digging in and what, you know, what they're doing because we don't know what their bank account looks like, Um, you know, but once we've done that and and we're pricing and uh, we do come to realize that, wow, we're quite a bit higher than our competitors and someone says you're too expensive. What do we say to that? That's okay. I think it's definitely okay to be on the more expensive end of the spectrum, Mm -hmm. but you have to show your potential clients why you're more expensive. Um, You have to show them the value in your products or services um, and make sure that they understand why they're paying a premium cost for you. Okay. How do you do that in your own business? For my own business, I am actually one of the more expensive planners in Birmingham. Mm -hmm. And the way that I've done that is, number one, um, I've made great relationships with vendors and my previous clients. Um, So my reviews are just really, um, there's a lot of them and they're really great. Um, And so I always um, show our clients that for one thing. Um, I offer to give them references. I know that not everybody loves that, but there's nothing better than, in my opinion, talking to someone else who has already been through this experience with me and letting them tell my potential clients how valuable it would be to work with me during their wedding planning process. And then we just do a lot of the feel good stuff. Um, in my opinion, shopping for wedding planning or a lot of wedding vendors is an emotional process for clients. And so I think a lot of it is about the way you make them feel. And so we make sure that the way that we're making them feel is very special from the very first touch point with us to the consultation in our office all the way through the experience and after we wrap up their wedding. And so um, I think that that's important as well when they're paying a premium cost for us. Yes, I love that. I have a quick question. You mentioned that you offer to give references. When you do that, do you have like a do you have like a set of past clients that are, you know, they are, they know that they may get a call from a potential couple from you? Um, how have you, how do you give them that contact information? And how do you, not that you're prepping people for what to say, but I imagine that you're like, hey, would you mind if you get calls from my potential couples? Absolutely. Well, I've kind of, um, you know, I've picked out the previous clients that I love the most because, you know, they just sing my praises. And so I will pick those first. But I like to try to target the past clients that have something in common with my current potential client, whether it's a venue or a vendor in common or they have similar styles. And then from there, I'll reach out to the past client and just let them know I have an inquiry. um, And I would love for them to chat with them about their experience with me and if they'd be willing to do that. And usually they are. And a lot of times it's really sealed the deal. Um, just because nobody can say it better than a past client. Yes, I love that. And I love that you are looking for something that they have in common, such as, you know, that like you say, the venue. Well, oh, you know, Kinsey got married at this venue, too. She'd probably be a great person to talk to. Um, and they automatically feel connected to that person. Right. Oh, gosh, Becky, so smart. I absolutely <laughs> love that. I'm just writing these down. I don't want to forget these notes. Okay, what do we say when... 
Okay, this might be, this answer might be a little different. Let's say like, let's say we're just starting out in business or let's say both. What would you say if you're just starting out and also if you'd been in business for a while when your friends or family members ask you for a discount and you just, you know, let's say you're new, like newer, one to two years in business, like you need the money, you have pricing, you're trying to stay on your pricing. Tell us how you navigate that situation. Personally, for me, I don't like to work with family and friends okay. um, just because I think it's kind of awkward. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I feel like it can possibly burn relationships and I feel like sometimes there can be more of a difficult client. Um, so for me personally, I, I don't like to mix business and pleasure. Um, so for me, I've just found that it's better to steer clear and I refer them off to someone, even if it is to my associate planner that's still a planner at Becky's Brides. If it's my family, I don't want to work with them personally because I want to set the clear business versus a personal relationship with everyone. Okay. And so if you refer them to an associate planner, would you give them the discount or not? Unfortunately not. Um, If they want to be treated like a client, they have to pay like a client. Um, So we don't give any kind of discounts for family members. Honestly, they're probably going to be the ones that are texting us late at night and the most difficult to work with um, just because they have that personal connection with us. And so we just don't you know, and they're also taking a date off our calendar. And so regardless of it being a, an emotional business and emotional time in their life, it is still a business for us. And we always treat it as such. Mm, that's so good. If you want to be treated like a client, you have to pay like a client. Right. <laughs> so true. That's your quotable. <laughs> okay, here is I just did a podcast about this uh, yesterday or Tuesday. So yesterday as we're recording this, but I'm interested to know what your take is on should I list my pricing on my website? Well, I think that there are pros and cons of both. Okay. Um, but Tell I us. do not list my prices on my website, not Mm -hmm. even starting prices, because I feel like a lot of times in the wedding industry, it's about education and people just don't know what they don't know. And so I don't want to, um, scare people away from inquiring with us because they see a starting price that they are not comfortable with, but really they just don't know that that's how much a planner costs or how much a a wedding coordinator costs. And so I feel like them, um, inquiring with us gives us the opportunity to show them value right off the bat. And I feel like we would have a better conversion rate because of that. With that being said, if we were getting 25 inquiries a day, I might feel a little bit differently. Okay. So when you, um, okay, let me, uh, this actually feeds into my, the next question that I kind of see a lot and I kind of put them together when, you know, it's, it's the digital age. So we get a lot of our email inquiries, right? That's kind of what we get. Now I, um, you know, for my venue and I, I think for a lot of people, we get those folks who just email us and are like, Hey, can I get your pricing and packages or whatever, you know, whatever they want to say. Um, so because you just mentioned that a lot of pricing really is about education in the industry, how do you handle those emails? when they are just like, hey, can I get your pricing? Well, I just treat them like any other inquiry and I respond back. Um, We do use canned responses to Mm -hmm. some extent, but we try to um, make it personal a little bit. You know, if they've said their venue, we'll tell them how much we love the venue or link a blog post to a wedding we've done previously at that venue. And then we attach um, some information about our company and what we offer. And then we tell them starting prices. Um, Most of our prices, especially for full service planning, is custom anyway. Um, And so we tell them right off the bat, the starting pricing that way, you know, if that's really not feasible for them, they're probably not going to respond, which is fine. Um, but it takes us two minutes to draft that email. So I just feel like, um, it's better to just respond to them and not get irritated about it and treat them like you would any other client. Cause you just don't ever know. Um, I'll go as far to say as we had a bride inquire with us once and it was not in her budget to hire us, but she referred a friend to us who did hire us. And I felt like that was part of the reason for that is that we treated her the same as we would have treated anybody else with a huge budget. Mm. And so, and you just mentioned that your pricing is custom. Now as a venue, my pricing is not custom. It is like, Mm -hmm. here's our price. And so we do have starting prices, but that's actually based on season, like seasonality, like peak season and off season. It's not based on, you know, the size of your wedding or anything like that. And so when you just, you do have a starting price, but it's, you know, for January Mm -hmm. (laughs) um, instead of like a June bride, what would you, what would you say to that? Like, uh, at, at the moment, I just give people our prices, but um, 
I mean, since we don't have to do anything custom, of course, we include everything about our business and all of that, too. Um, but do you feel like that's do you feel like we should be trying to get people in the door first before we give them our prices? I would stick with the starting pricing because it, at the venue shopping point of um, a bride's journey, mm-hmm. a lot of times the date is determined based on the venue they book. So right. if you give them starting prices and they might be a June bride um, and they decide, well, I couldn't really afford the June prices, but I love this venue so much. I'm going to move my date to January to, so I can afford the venue that I love. Um, that's probably how I would tackle it. Mm, that's interesting. Love that. This is so good. Oh my gosh. Also, <laughs> Becky, I love how you're just like, here's the question and you're all, boom, here's the answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, with the background in accounting, I know that I'm a little weird in the creative industry that I, I really do kind of love the numbers and I think it's fun to talk about. <laughs> I do too. I'm serious. I know. I'm like, oh, I, I'm writing down my own questions now. I'm like, sorry guys, this is a self-serving <laughs> podcast episode. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So... This, and this, again, this is really broad, but um, I think that particularly with, you know, paid marketing and things of that nature, it can be difficult to know where to allocate your dollars. So assuming that we, you know, at the beginning of the podcast, we were talking about, you know, what do you want to bring in? What do you need to pay for taxes? What are your fixed costs? Things of that nature. So assuming that we've done that legwork and that background work, how much of our profit, and, and this is not a dollar amount, but how much of our profit should we be allocating to marketing? And is that different depending on what stage of business we're in? I think it's different depending on what stage of business you're in and okay. what your goals are. Mm-hmm. Um, I think also, I think it depends on what type of marketing. Like, are we talking about marketing as in like marketing materials? Or are we talking about like marketing like the knot or wedding wire or something similar to that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, th- I think it just really varies based on your ideal client, where your current or prospective clients are coming from and where you want them to be coming from. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts on those large wedding directories uh, like the knot and like wedding wire where we could easily give them, you know, $6,000 a year? <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's kind of scary because it's a shot in the dark on mm-hmm. if it's going to work for you or not. Um, Personally, for me, um, it's not something I do anymore. However, it is something I did when I started and I felt like that it was successful. Um, Of course, I'm a lot more expensive now than when I started and I have a different ideal client now than I did when I started. So when I was first creating Becky's Brides, it was it worked for me because it was getting my name out there. I was getting a lot more inquiries um, than I probably normally would have. Um, And it just allowed me to build a client base, I think, faster um, than had I not done that. However, with that being said, now that I've been doing this for a while and my prices are a lot higher and have a specific ideal client, um, that's not really where my ideal clients are coming from. So I don't utilize them anymore. How long did you utilize them? Probably for the first two years, I'd say. Mm. How old is Becky's Brides? Six years as of April. Oh, what? oh my gosh. Like just over <laughs> six years. Oh, congratulations. That's wonderful. Thank you. That is fabulous. And we're, do you, and um, you don't have to tell me specifics, but do you remember when you use like the knot and the wedding and wedding wire, uh, did you have, you know, they have like all of these, these steps of plans and I think it's hard to decide you know, because you don't know. I mean, yeah, you could get like the do you feel like you got quality leads or do you feel like you just got a lot? And because you got a lot of leads, your conversion rate was better. That's probably what it is. I got a lot of leads. So my conversion rate was better. Um, as far as the packages that I select, I look to see what planners in my area um did and tried to either be the same or above them. Mm -hmm. So for instance, when a bride was going to the knot and searching for a wedding planner, I didn't, if I was going to pay, I didn't want to be listed below any wedding planners. Um, and so luckily for my area, not very many planners advertised on the knot. So I was able to just get the cheapest package and it put me above all the other planners. It wasn't the same for wedding wire. It seemed like a lot of planners here, um, back then advertised on wedding wire. So I had to spend more money there. Um, but I just, Pick the package based on that. Mm, brilliant. So now that you're six years into business, how does your marketing look different? Um, my marketing is completely different. We don't do any kind of paid advertising um, because we've been doing this for a while. The majority of our clients come from either social media, word of mouth, or Google. Um, we did invest some money and time on our SEO a couple years ago, and that was really helpful. But our best and you know our clients that we'd say are absolutely ideal are always referrals. 
And do you feel like they're referrals from past clients or vendors or both? Both. Oh, interesting. Do you do anything specifically um, as far as investing in, you know, vendor relationships? Yes. So um, we spend a lot of time on that because I feel like it's the most important thing are my relationships with the vendors. Um, Even though I'm a planner and a lot of times people think that um, brides go to planners first, that's not always the case. And we always get a lot of referrals from venues, photographers, and even florists sometimes. And so we spend a lot of time developing those relationships and and some money as well. Um, Mainly, we try to go to all the networking events. Um, We'll go to dinner or coffee or lunch um, with specific vendors that either refer us or we want to work with or we do work with a lot just to let them know that we appreciate them. We do small gifts throughout the year, but I think the most important thing is the time we spend, you know, going to these events and reminding people, hey, we're still here. Make sure you send us business, please. And we in turn do the same for them as well. I love that. And I, I'm so glad you said that. Um, if you didn't catch that, you guys, Becky said they mostly invest time, but they also invest a little bit of money, you know, small gifts throughout the year. And I don't think that that has to be a huge monetary investment. Honestly, I think that do, do you feel that way? I think I mean, if someone just knows you're thinking about them, and you send them, you know, just a small, even if it's just edible, whatever it is, I feel like just the, the fact that you're thinking about them is really the point. Absolutely. I agree. And we don't, we don't usually spend a ton of money on vendor gifts. A lot of times it's edible. Um, we'll try to do local bakeries or mm-hmm. local candy companies here. Um, donuts for breakfast. After, a lot of times after a big wedding, we'll take the ven- the key vendors that we worked with that helped us pull off these, these big events. And then the next week we'll take them donuts and breakfast for their team. Um, so it definitely, you don't have to spend a lot of money to give people the warm and fuzzies, which is what we're trying to do with our brides and what we're always trying to do with our vendors as well. Mm, I love that. And I guess similarly, since you just mentioned and you mentioned it earlier, you know, it is an, an emotional decision to hire a wedding vendor and you, you're making them feel good. So can you kind of talk to us about how, uh, you know, throughout your planning process or uh, what, you know, what does your client experience look like from a financial investment standpoint, if there is one? Um, We do invest in client experience um, with our brides, um, starting with when they first walk in our door, we gift them during our consultation. Um, It's some kind of gift that's usually about $10, Mm -hmm. um, but we want them to, you know, immediately feel connected with us. Um, We spend a lot of time during the console and we prefer to do these face to face. Um, I don't feel like personally I ever connect well with people on the phone or on Skype nearly as much as I can connect with them in person. Mm -hmm. And so we really strive to do all our consults in person, you know, assuming that's possible. Um, So we gift them during the consult and then we gift them throughout the year of the time we're working with them, usually once halfway through and then once towards the end of the process or after the wedding. Um, And these things are usually like um, when they come in, sometimes it's like a Starbucks gift card or, um, like a little bride notebook or coffee mug or something small for the, um, in the, the beginning of the process. And then halfway through, um, sometimes we'll just email them a Starbucks e-gift card, you know, to tell them to take a break from wedding planning and go get some coffee. And then at the end, we do something like watercolors, um, paintings of their venue or their bouquet or whatever their favorite design element was. Sometimes we'll do um, their vows in calligraphy or their first dance in calligraphy, something really special that we can end the wedding planning process on a high note. Oh, I love that. So brilliant. In addition to the gifting part, Mm -hmm. I think part of the client experience is a lot more than just gifting. And so we really strive... um, on our communication um, aspects to make them feel like they are our only broad. Um, we return emails really quickly. Um, I know some people don't like to, but we do text message um, just because it's easier and they feel like we want them to feel like they're our friend. Um, so the whole time we're just really trying to make them feel like they're our only broad, even though we're probably working with 25 at the same time. Mm-hmm. Well, and I know this doesn't really have a lot to do with pricing, but uh, since you brought it up, do you have any, uh, do you have any, you know, really hard, I, I'm going to say rules just because, you know, that's kind of what we're talking about. But do you have any like hard rules about the texting though? Like we don't answer after 10 or whatever, you know, like, can you tell me about that? I mean, uh, leading up to the wedding, like, you know, a couple days in advance, I'm sure you're like, text me whenever. But um, do you have any, any guidelines around that for brides? 
Absolutely. When we send them our welcome email, we tell them that we prefer email communication. However, they usually text us at some point and that's fine. We always let them text us first. We don't ever text them first. And then um, as far as texting, we just treat it the same way as we would treat emails. So if they text me during business hours, I'll pretty much respond immediately. But if they text me after hours, unless it's a, an emergency or their wedding week or something like that. I'll just wait till the next day to respond. Mm, brilliant. And do you, um, what was I about to ask you? I, I think I lost my train of thought. Okay. I'll, I'll think of it. I'm sure. Um, okay. I have a, we've kind of danced around this a little bit, which is like raising your prices and charging, you know, what is going to bring in like profit in your business and things of that nature. When, assuming, you know, we've been in business for a while or a little bit and we, and we feel really good, we're booking brides, we're booking couples, how, how will we know when the right time is to raise our prices? I think when you're consistently booking a ton of your inquiries, if everybody's saying yes, you're priced too low. Mm. And so I think that um, your ratio of brides saying yes versus no um, has to be a lot lower for you to feel like your prices are in my opinion, where they should be. Mm-hmm. Um, it's kind of challenging though, because once you do that and then all these brides start saying no, it's kind of scary, but it's definitely, I feel like the right thing and it'll make you feel so much better about it when that first bride does say yes after you've raised your prices. And when you, after you've raised your prices, how can you tell, how do you communicate that with your clients or with potential clients? We just um, change it during the, our consult process and through the inquiry process as far as we, we tell them a different starting price. Mm-hmm. So we don't make an announcement or anything like that. It's just when people inquire, we just say, well, these are our starting prices. And um, no one's ever, ever wiser on that. Mm-hmm. I don't think I don't want to make a big like announcement or launch or anything about new pricing because I feel like brides wouldn't love that, you know, kind of yeah. scare them off a little bit. So we just do it internally. And then when they start inquiring, we let them know what our pricing is. Mm. And if we have referrals coming to us and they're like, well, hey, my friend got married here, you know, last year, or she, you know, used your services last year or two years ago or six months ago, whatever it is, what, how can we, how can we approach that in a, in a really meaningful and sweet way, but also just like, hey, my prices are higher now. <laughs> Right. Um, we just, we ran into that once and, um, we just let them know that we completely understand, you know, if it's, it's not the right fit now based on our new pricing structure. Um, but you know, the market changes and prices typically for any kind of business go up every year. And this is what our pricing is now. And here's why, um, a lot of times ours has to do with taking less brides so we can give them more one-on-one attention. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we try to sell it like that. Oh, I love that. We take less people to give a more one-on-one attention. Brilliant. Okay, this has been the fastest interview of my life. Um, it, <laughs> we are coming up on 30 minutes. So, uh, Becky, I would love quickly, I, I have a follow-up question after this, but we've covered so much ground here, but is there anything that I haven't asked uh, in, in today's uh, podcast interview, or is there something that you're just dying to make sure that people know when it comes to pricing, profit, Etc. in our wedding businesses? Sure. Um, I think the most important thing I learned for myself when I was really looking into my pricing and deciding to raise my pricing is something Valerie Gernhauser said to me. Mm-hmm. And she says, you are not your target market and that's okay. Um, when I first started raising my prices, I was like, I would never pay this much money for a wedding planner. Mm -hmm. And to this day, I still would not pay how much I charge for a wedding planner because I'm not my target market. And I think if you can get past thinking about what you would pay for a wedding planner or a photographer or a venue and really crunch the numbers instead, um, you'll always be more successful and you'll have a different way of thinking about it as well. That is so good. Thank you so much. Where can everyone find you online, Becky? They can find us on Instagram at Becky's Brides and on Facebook at Becky's Brides and on the web, of course, at Becky'sBrides.com. Thank you so very much. It has truly been such a pleasure and just an honor to learn from you today. I really appreciate your time. Thanks so much for having me. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening to She Creates Business. Please take a minute and head to iTunes to leave an honest review so we can help more wedding pros find the show.